hello, and welcome to a special bonus of the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative's sixth Net Zero Conference, a fireside chat with Melissa Hoffer and Melissa Lavinson. I'm Dorothy Savarese, board president of the Climate Collaborative, and I'm so thrilled to introduce Melissa Hoffer, Massachusetts' first ever climate chief. Uh, you probably know that on the very first full day of uh, Governor Healy's administration, she created the position of climate chief and appointed Chief Hoffer. And what a background. Melissa Hoffer joined the Biden administration as a day one political appointee, serving as the acting general counsel and principal deputy general counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency. And she led the EPA's Office of General Counsel through the transition until November 2021, and then continued to serve as principal deputy general counsel. She has undertaken a whole of government approach to address the challenges and opportunities of climate change facing the Commonwealth. And we're delighted to welcome her as the host of today's fireside chat. So I'm delighted to be with my colleague, Melissa Lavinson, who comes to us from National Grid, where she was the head of corporate affairs for New England, and now is the first um, first director of our Office of Energy Transformation. It's a brand new office that was put in place in our Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and she's going to tell us all about what she's doing. So I, I couldn't be happier to have Melissa with us today. I'll talk a lot about energy transition. We're in the midst of a big energy transition. Could you kind of explain to us a little bit about, um, you know, what that is, how your background um, prepared you for this work, and tell us a little bit about how that fits together. Great. Thank you. And, and, and Melissa, it's great to be here with you, and, and it's great to have this opportunity. And, you know, as you know, we are, we are in the midst of a, of a transition, of a transformation, really, of our energy ecosystem uh, here in Massachusetts and around the country and around the world. We're, what we're really doing is undertaking a massive change management effort um, that has an environmental imperative. And so when you put those two things together and an in urgency to act, an imperative to act, because we see the impacts of climate change today, and then a system that's been operating and functioning the same way for about the past hundred years, and it's been doing its job. It's been delivering safe, reliable energy to people for for, to power their lives, to power their businesses, to heat their homes, right? To, to do what they want to do day in, day out. And so what, what we're really doing is we're taking this massive undertaking of transforming all aspects of our energy system from the way we produce energy to the way we deliver it to how we consume it as end users. Uh, and we're doing this all along, all along the value chain. And so when I think about transformation, um, I think about it really in those buckets, about what is the technology that we need to actually deliver energy to people that's cleaner than it is today, that meets our climate and clean energy mandates. Um, what are the processes that we have to change? What do we have to do along the way? How do we have to do things a bit differently uh, than we've done them in the past so that we can connect more solar, we can connect more wind, we can connect electric vehicles to the grid and make them all work. We can manage our buildings more uh, smarter. Uh, we can make them stronger. We can make them more resilient. And then, Finally, there's the people aspect. And I, and I think you know, that's the part that we're really focusing on here, bringing people together to understand where we are, where we're going, and how we're gonna get there. And that's really the essence of transformation. So when I think about it, I think about it in those buckets, about what we have, what we need to do, um, and then how we have to bring everybody together to get it done. So you and I have talked a bit about that change management process. And you know our roles are are similar in that way because they're they're both brand new, and you know while, while I am focused on transforming the way that government does its work to align with our climate goals, you're doing sort of something really similar for the energy system, um, and you know there's sort of the sense that like, you know I I I think you share this view like I feel pretty confident we're going to get there with the technology and I feel pretty confident we're going to get there with the financing, but it's this change management piece that keeps me up at night. So I know that you have experience with that from your prior positions at GRID. Um, and I'm just, I'm hoping that you could talk to us a little bit more about how you see change management as a central part of what you're doing and how do you approach it? 
what what can we learn from you about that? Because you've you've been in these positions before. No, thanks. It's a it's a it's a great question. It's not easy. Um, and and I think when we've seen transformative change be successful, it's because we we work we walk through it in a methodical way. Um, but the first thing you have to really do is make sure that you're bringing kind of the breadth of the ecosystem or everybody that's going to be touched by the change together. And for energy, that's hard because we all have a relationship with it. We all have a unique relationship with it, depending who we are, how we use it, our income levels, right? We're a home or business. It, it can be complex or it can be something that we don't think about. And so I think that that's the first challenge and that's the first way we're thinking about it. So at the Office of Energy Transformation, one of the first things we did was create an advisory board. And I know for some people that might sound like, oh, great, you created an advisory board, but it was really important. It's important because it really is representative of the breadth of the energy ecosystem here in Massachusetts. We have 70 folks representing organizations um, and, and businesses, uh, environmental justice, environmental justice advocates. Um, uh, we have labor unions, we've got uh, manufacturers, end users, consumer advocates, utilities, we have fossil fuel companies, right? Because they're the ones that, yeah. that we're saying we're going to be moving away from. So we're bringing everybody together. We just had our first meeting. And the next thing of change management you have to do is align around the outcome. Make sure everybody's working towards the same outcome. And there was universal agreement that we understand where we have to go and we have to get there. And then the next thing you have to do is figure out what are what's the baseline understanding. And, and that's really what I've seen work well um, at companies when we've gone through big change management is everybody starting from the same place. So that's what we're doing as we work through the process here with Office of Energy Transformation with this advisory board is really setting that baseline understanding of, of where we are. What's the energy system look like today? How does it work? How do people get energy? Um, what do you need to do to change it? What are the steps you have to go through to actually get something from ideation to implementation? And that's how we're going to work through this. So Again, it, it, it might sound kind of rote, um, but that's what change management is. It's about putting one foot in front of the other in the right order in order to get there and get the outcome that then everybody can align around and, and, and everybody can help implement. And that's what makes it really sustainable. I love that. And I love I love your emphasis on the level setting and making sure everybody's kind of starting from the same baseline and, and then building trust through this, this process. So, so you come into this, you know, you've, you've got this like huge order that came out from the, the DPU at the end of last year. I'm hoping maybe you'll touch on it. But there's like many different directions you can go and you, you have settled on like some really clear priorities. And I'm, I'm hoping you can talk to people a little bit about what those are and maybe, um, you know, some of the specific focus areas of the advisory board. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when this office was established, Office of Energy Transformation, there were three high level areas um, that it was charged with focusing on in terms of creating that sort of intentional execution around. One was gas to electric transition and how do we make that from a dual fuel system, if you will, to one where we're much more reliant on, on the electric grid and if not fully at some point. Um, second one is if you're gonna be reliant on a, on a system like the electric system to make sure we have electric grid readiness. And then the third area was again, this, this change, this people part. Right, we have the technology process, but people. So how do we ensure that as we're doing this, we have a, a, a just and equitable transition for the workers, right? That are yes. that are you know there today, so keeping okay. the system running, keeping it safe. We're going to need them mm -hmm. to keep working, um, and we need to work with them also to understand what the opportunities are, you know, as we move through the transition. For the businesses, there's businesses that that rely on the energy system as it exists today. Um, and we're going to have new businesses created. So how do we make sure that as we're doing the transition, we're working with both and then communities? Um, you know, there's going to be a community impact, both the community impact from new infrastructure, community impact from new you know, development, new renewables, et cetera. But there's also communities that rely on some of the existing infrastructure we have today for their tax base, right? Schools, libraries. So we're going to have to work through all that. So that's sort of the charge of the office. Um, and those are big. They're really big issues, right? You could spend a lot of time kind of trying to, to work your way through them. And so what we talked about with the advisory board was focusing on, on very tangible things. Um, and we got a lot of feedback from stakeholders when we were setting up this office. They said they wanted to focus on tangible things. They wanted to be in a position where they had to make 
binary choices and that they understood the consequence of the choice. So if it was, we don't want an, this asset, then then the consequence of not wanting that or replacing it would be that we need to do these three or four things. And if we're mm -hmm. not willing to do those three or four things, then we know that the outcome is status quo. And people really wanted to, to do that. And they thought it would be a lot easier to move through these if we really focused on things. So that's what we're doing. We have three focus areas. Um, they're a little esoteric, but I'll just do them at a very high level. Um, the first yeah. one is around an asset uh, called the Everett Marine Terminal Liquefied Natural Gas Facility in Everett, Massachusetts. What is it? It's basically a big gas storage facility. Um, for those that aren't aware, Massachusetts is, is constrained in the capacity of the amount of natural gas we can bring in. So on a cold winter day, like that day that we had back in February of 2023, when I think it hit negative 43 degrees for a period of time there, um, we needed to call on different storage assets that we have around the state. We have lots of these assets around the state. This is the biggest one of them. Um, it can provide up to 10% of the um, our peak demand needs on that coldest day. Uh, our utilities entered into a, a, a supply contract with this facility um, for six years. And when they got that contract approved by the regulator, the regulator said, okay, we understand why we need it, but it's expensive and it's not consistent with where we're going. And so that's the first focus area is how are we going to transition away from our reliance on that asset? It is the ultimate of gas to electric transition. Yeah, um, It really is about electric grid readiness. It's about a just transition for the workers that are there today. We, we need them to, to continue to do their jobs. Um, and we owe it to them also that, you know, how we work through that to make sure that on the other end, as we move away from it, that that they have great careers. Um, and yeah. we need to put the community that's been hosting this asset for, you know, tens of thousands of us around the state um, for decades. They've been hosting major fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, how do we work with them so that as we come out the other end of this, when, you know, we move away from this asset, that there's an opportunity. Um, yes. For this as well. Yeah. So it's really the kind of embodiment of those of those areas. Um, similarly, we're looking at some of the fossil fuel fire power plants that we still have in, in the state called peaking plants. Again, kind of like this gas asset, they help meet our electric demand on that hottest day. Uh, when, and a peaking plant is, peaking is plant. some a plant that will kind of come in and help us sort of shave our peak energy demand at these times of like, as you said, the hottest yeah. summer day when we the might have day. more cooling need. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So we have, you know, we, we use sort of a steady amount of energy, but then when it's really hot right now and in the future, when it gets really cold and we move to electric heat, we, we spike for a period of time, we go back down and there are these facilities that that's what they do, but they rely on things uh, like running on natural gas or oil. So higher polluting, um, higher emitting uh, fuels. And they have not just a climate impact, but a local air quality impact because they are they are higher emitting. They do actually have local air quality impacts that can affect public health. So that's another thing we're looking at. We have identified four facilities that have been great to step forward to say, hey, we're willing to figure out what else we can do here. How can we use the space we have, the interconnection with the grid that we have, um, what are the options, both on the demand and the supply side, to maybe reduce our reliance on them or maybe even transition them to a completely clean asset? And one of those facilities happens to be in uh, Sandwich, Massachusetts, right there on the on the Cape, the canal generating station. Yeah. They step forward to say, we're interested in looking at something different. Um, and then the final focus area is is cost. Uh, affordability is a big issue. We, we get that. We understand that. We have to make investments in the system to move us through to get to cleaner sources that are actually going to be less volatile fuels. So reduce that price volatility for people actually become a much more affordable source. But we have to make investments in the near term to get through this period. And so how do we do that in a way that you know mitigates the impact on customer bills? Are there different kinds of ways to finance these investments other than financing it all on a utility bill? So those are the areas that we're looking at. They're meaty, they're meaty, they're complex, but they really are tangible things that, you know, if we work through them successfully with this group, we will make transformative change and, and change that we can look at an asset specific or an issue specific, but really figure out how to scale that up. That's great. There's like a million directions I want to go with this, but it's it's super exciting. <laughs> it reminds me, I remember that day very well in February of 2023 
yeah. and it's, it's too long of a story to tell um, here, but suffice it to say, I had heat pumps here that ran well through that event. It was also the only time I ever had to put my buck goats into the barn with my does to help keep them warm. And that is how I got a baby goat in July. So <laughs> I, I, will, I will never forget that day. Um, so a couple of things kind of um, really interesting, I think, in what you just said, all of it really interesting. Um, and, you know, and I hear a little bit in what you're saying, it's connected to what um, we're trying to do across the board with look at this level of investment that's required to get to net zero by 2050 and really start thinking now. I mean, the Commonwealth is not unique in this regard, but, you know, I, I think aside from New York, like no one has really kind of drilled down to think about how are we going to get there and what is that investment? So that's super exciting. And I hope everybody understands, like, that's very innovative and really, really important um, for for the reasons that that you just laid out. I also am hearing in what you're saying, you know, a lot about the sense of like the increasing demand. So we see, you know, just the, the shift to electrification causing an increase. But I think we've probably all heard things about increasing electric demand from things like cryptocurrency or AI or data centers. So I'm wondering if you could, you know, talk a little bit of that. I mean, I've heard estimates that just for electrification, we might be looking at doubling or even quadrupling demand. Like, is it is that really our future or are there other things that we can do as well to try to um, get to that electrification goal? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, those estimates are right. What we've seen, at least you know, even from our regional electric system operator, ISO New England, they've been putting out estimates of they're seeing, you know, a two to three times um, increase in electric demand as a result of just right, load growth in general but then electrification growth, right? Electrifying heating and electrifying transportation in particular. Um, and so we are looking at that, at both sides of that equation, right? You could try to build your way out of it, um, or you could try to mitigate, right? The amount of demand you have through being more energy efficient, um, putting in innovative programs where customers can actually sign up to say, you know what? I can reduce my energy load and my energy need at that peak period of time so that you don't have to build for me. And I think that's the important part for folks to understand. When, when utilities uh, build their infrastructure or when someone like ISO New England says, this is the amount of generation they need um, or power plants that they need you know, on the system, they're looking at that peak demand. They're doing their, their calculations or estimates and saying, at that moment, on that hottest day or in the future, that coolest day when we electrify heat and we have our electric vehicles, everything's plugged in, what could that peak possibly be? And that's what they're building towards. So anything that we can do to start to what we call shave that peak on the demand side, lower our demand, be more efficient, uh, turn you know our own electric vehicles in the future that have batteries into kind of mini yes. sources of generation to sell back to the grid to say, don't worry about it or put batteries with solar on our home and say, I can, I can island myself right now. You don't need to worry about me. I'll come on when you need me. Those are opportunities that we see. Those are innovations. And like I said, we've got the technology to figure out how to do this. Now we, now we've got to figure out the process change that we need, the rules, the policies, right? What investments the utilities need to make to make sure their system can actually do that because it wasn't built to do that. Um, so it needs to change. And then once we get those in place, then we need the people part, right? We need customers like you and me to understand we have a role to play and, and that we actually can help really mitigate not only the amount of infrastructure we have to build, but the cost, yeah. the cost to all of us, right? We can, we can make money for ourselves, but we can help reduce the cost for the entire system. And that's really how we have to move through this and think about all aspects of that. So, you know, it's very interesting, Listen, when you said that it immediately made me think of, um, you know, what's unfolding in, in Western North Carolina. A colleague was telling me this morning that there are some areas where folks had purchased electric vehicles, electric trucks and the like, that are now able to power some of their home's needs from the charge that's left in that battery. So that made me think a little bit about resilience and how do we build resilience into this energy transition? And maybe if you could just talk a little bit, you know, we've got climate impacts to all of our infrastructure. Um, how do we think about that with our grid infrastructure? And how do we think about ways to incorporate resilience as we're modernizing the grid? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And, and you know, the, 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 the good news is the, the utility industry has been thinking a lot about this um, and thinking about long, not just recently, but, you know, this goes back, you know, at least 10 years. Um, thinking about this as the, as the industry and as we've all been seeing storms intensify and the frequency of the storms, right? And, and we've also been seeing storms changing. Um, sometimes you have these massive events like, like we just saw with Lean, like we're going to see with Milton. Um, but sometimes we have smaller events that do incredible damage, uh, microbursts, right, derechos. We yes. see them and, and they're very localized, but they do incredible damage. And so utilities have seen both large scale um, and, and kind of these you know, more localized events. And so they've been doing lots of things to their systems. One of the things that they've been doing is adding a lot more automation to their system. And, and again, it takes time, but they've been adding a lot more automation all along um, their power lines, their distribution lines and, and on the transmission system too. So there's, a, there's, a, there's some technologies that they have that can sense um, when there might be an issue now on a line and it can automatically figure out where that impact is. So that's the, amazing. The impact, yeah, when something hmm. would come down right on the line, it would knock out maybe 2,000 customers at once. And they couldn't, they have to go out and figure out where it was. Now they have sensor technology that they can start to actually ping it and figure out and close that in. So instead of 2,000 people being out for, say, six hours, now you might have just a momentary outage. And that automatically will, call, they're called reclosers, close the system in. And now we can minimize that impact to maybe 500 customers. So those are the kinds of technologies that are out there that the utilities are deploying um, from sort of that sensing side. They're also doing a lot more on the hardening side, right? They're looking at where the floodplains are. They're understanding what they have to do with their substations. They're looking at strategic undergrounding of wires and lines, right? They're looking at strategic management of the vegetation to make sure, right, that there's the right clearance that they need so that we don't just have, you know, when the wind blows and blows, you know, limbs and trees into it. So there's multiple layers that the utilities are doing. And so as they're thinking about the investments that they're making, they're thinking about this on their systems, where, when, how to do it, what redundancies need to be created. And then also, again, working with customers, right, yeah. to create resilience on their side and think through where could we strategically work with customers to put battery, to put battery solar so that we can call on it as a resilience asset, as a grid asset. So there, there's multiple sides to that, but this is something that's definitely, um, you know, part of the equation. And I think the best example I've seen here of that is what Eversource did out in Provincetown with the battery. Yes. A large scale battery in Provincetown. And, and it's really made a huge difference um, for the reliability during storms um, for that part of the cave, right? It's isolated. There's one line in, one line out. Um, now they have that battery and it comes on and they've seen a real improvement in reliability um, as they've seen frequency and severity of storms increase. So that's that's a great um, that's a great pivot. I was thinking about municipalities in particular. We hear lots of lots of concern from them. You know, they're not all similarly situated in terms of the resources that may be available to them. So, you know, thinking about, you know, contrasting a rural municipality with, you know, an, an urban municipality um, and what what's your advice for a municipality that's both trying to um, green itself and accelerate its own decarbonization across the board and make itself more resilient? What should municipalities be thinking about in terms of this transition? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the first thing I always say and being going back to my kind of background and and. 30 years in utilities is I, I, I've always found partnership to be the best. Um, and, 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 and one thing that I think is really important is utilities don't know what they don't know. Right. So they don't, they don't know necessarily what all the plans of all the municipalities are, um, you know, in, in their service areas or the timing of those plans or, or what some of the most important things are. Well, they try really hard. Sometimes they you don't. You mean know. for stuff like new development, Melissa? For new or... development. Yeah, um, okay. Or, or decarbonization goals for their own resilience goals, right? Um, and, and you know, Massachusetts is, is wonderful. You know, we have so many municipalities and communities that have their own decarbonization plans, have their own resilience plans, also have their own um, economic development goals and, and kind of putting all of that together. And so the first thing I always say is reach out right, work with your utility, because one, there's a lot of programs that are available that they have. They're making their own investment decisions um, based on what they think they know, not what they might be the reality of what they should be basing it on. Um, 
they're, you know, and for them, they're looking at investments in sort of the three-year timeline, the four or five, a six-year timeline. So it's never too early. So if you're a municipality that's saying, I want to add some resilience to my community, I want to electrify, uh, you know, some of my fleets, I, I want to figure out how I can decarbonize, you know, my government buildings. I would say, you know, that's that's all incredibly, you know, valuable information to be sharing and sharing early because that partnership could then allow an investment decision to be made on the utility side that they may not have made, you know, a proposal to put forward to, to their commission, to the commission, to the regulator here that they may not have put forward. So I think that's sort of the first thing. Um, the second one is there's a lot of resources that the state has, right? Through the Green Communities Program, through the MVP program, there's a lot of resources that the state has working with municipalities, both for technical assistance, but also providing grants um, to help support these very activities. And so I would say that's sort of another thing that, you know, you have the utility support, but you also have the support of the state um, that's that's got great expertise and, and programs available to help actually build resilience and decarbonize. Well, that's fantastic. And it, there's sort of a related question that often comes up in, in, when we talk about, um, and I've, I've heard it on the Cape as well, so maybe it's it's particularly apropos, but, you know, thinking about some of the folks that are out there wanting to to develop solar projects um, and, and maybe develop battery projects and, you know, what advice do you have to them to, um, you know, help address the the gap sometimes between you know when when you'd like to have that project come online and then you know how how it might take a bit of time in terms of interconnection delays what is the best advice for those folks um as they're planning their process yeah I, and again i think it's the 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 early outreach is really critical and working to understand where capacity might be available um, on a system for a utility because while a municipality or a customer, large customer you're trying to bring in or help out might say, I want to cite it here. Um, if there's flexibility, the utility might be able to say, actually, if you cited it over there, <laughs> that we actually can serve it over there. We can interconnect you much quicker. Uh, or being uh, being creative of of saying of being able to you know co-locate a battery and and say solar, where then you can manage how much you're putting on the grid at a time. Because while you might want to cite something that's say two megawatts of, of solar, the grid might only be able to handle one megawatt right now, mm -hmm. but you want to put that on. So is there a way to pair that with battery where you can store some of that energy so you're only sending what the grid can handle at that moment, recognizing that over time, then the utility knows we need to make investments in this area to get you to where you want to be over time to send back to the grid. But right now this is what we can handle. So I think that those conversations are super important to have. So communicating early and often, and that makes a lot of sense. So we're talking about a huge amount of infrastructure here. And I'm thinking back to, this was several months ago, and I was listening to the Reverend Mariama White Hammond talk a little bit about um, her vision for how communities might ultimately, you know, perceive this type of, of siting of infrastructure. And this conversation had grown out of, um, you know, what was a, a difficult controversy for one particular Massachusetts community that didn't necessarily want new infrastructure. Um, and we were talking about another Massachusetts community that was a, a bit more affluent that also didn't want this, this infrastructure. And, you know, the, the way she said it was so new to me, it's stuck. And I just really love it that ideally where we want to get is that all communities are welcoming this infrastructure and they want to be a part of the clean energy transition. And that means that we might need, you know, new substations in some places and we might need new power lines in some places. So I was curious how you think about framing it um, and how you think about the role of, you know, really, again, you know, municipalities in thinking about welcoming this infrastructure and what it might mean and how to talk to people about it because it's a big change. Yeah, I, I completely, completely agree. And, and, and um, having kind of been on multiple sides of that, totally understand, right? It is, um, it is an unknown sometimes to people what it is, how does it function? What's it going to do? How's it going to impact me? And I think, you know, again, back to the building understanding and building a relationship and building trust. That's a really important thing to do. Um, and it's, I think, you know, incumbent on, on, on the utilities, right? On, on the companies that want to come in 
to both understand um, the communities that they're coming into, understand the history that those communities have had with infrastructure, um, uh, understand right what the landscape is and what the expectations are, and then work really closely with the communities and the municipalities um, more broadly ar around that to, to recognize, right, one, let's talk about the infrastructure that's already there. Yeah. So, right, we all, we all interact with infrastructure every day. Sometimes we don't even know that we are, right? Um, we, we have power lines, poles, transformers in every community, right? Roads, water, water lines, sewer lines, lines, gas lines. lines right, yeah. right. So we, we, we have infrastructure. Um, and so infrastructure is a good thing, right? It's what allows us to function as we function. Um, and recognizing that if we want to do more, particularly on the energy side, and if we want that to be different than the energy we have today, if we want it to be cleaner, if we want it to be more resilient, if we want it to be more reliable, if we want to be able to, uh, you know, quickly uh, connect our solar, our storage, our electric vehicles, or connect new business to a, to the electric grid, it means that we're going to need that grid to be able to function differently. It needs more capacity, right? It, it's it's sort of at the point that it's been managing very well, and then needs more needs to be done. So I think it's sort of educating on what what do you what's the benefit of the infrastructure, not yeah. just writ large, but to the community, to the individual, to the municipality. Then you can have a conversation about that and recognize if you if we if we don't move forward with the infrastructure, what's then what does that mean? That means that we might get delays. Right, yeah. we we won't get to to where where maybe are the decarbonization goals that we want to get to for that community, for the municipality, or we might not be able to plug in as much new business, um, or we might not be able to interconnect that solar storage to create a resilience hub, right, for a community that desperately needs a place to go in a severe storm. So I think it's talking about the outcomes and and what the infrastructure enables, not just the infrastructure itself, and that's hard. It takes time, but I think it's the importance of that conversation. I love that, Melissa. And I think it's so true. And we're, you know, I'm thinking about this um, study that came out from Potsdam Institute in the spring, which we've we've talked about, and just the notion that you know we're looking at 38 trillion dollars annually by 2050 globally to respond to the damages caused by climate change, you know, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions that have have already occurred. So if you think about you know, and they, they also concluded it's six times more expensive to respond, amount of response to those damages than it is to invest in keeping us at the safer Paris target of two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial level. So, so when I think about what you're saying, I think like these are monetizable benefits, you know, and, and we talk about them with people, but it's, it's the avoided future damages of climate change. It's the health benefits of shifting away from fossil fuels. And we get, it's not just greenhouse gases, we get reduced NOx and SO2 and particulate matter and all the cardiovascular and pulmonary impacts that, that those have. Um, you know, we, we also get the resilience benefits that you were talking about too. So, you know, these are really important things to think about. And when, when you look at like even the investment that's required to modernize the grid, it's a real bargain compared yeah. to those other costs. And that's such an important point that you're making with this. So you you said a couple things in here that I just want to unpack a little bit as, as we're as we're beginning to close. And and one is, you know, you've talked a couple of times about just transition. And here you're you're mentioning it's really important to understand the history of a community. And I think that's really true. And then you've talked a lot about the need to be laser focused on ensuring that it's a just transition for workers. So those are really important things. And it's it's kind of linked with the governor's vision for and Secretary Howe's vision for economic development. Um, and Emily Reichert, who's the director of Mass CEC. And you know, we're looking at you know, it, it, we're at this moment and it's a challenging moment and we've got some rough sledding ahead, but we also have enormous opportunity in this moment with this transition. It's, you know, like so much happening with our own homegrown companies. So can you just like give your best effort to kind of knit that together and talk a little bit about, you know, the economic development benefits and, and some job opportunities and the like for this just transition? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're, and you're absolutely correct. We, we, we do We do have a moment. Um, to act to continue the leadership that we've shown on developing these new businesses, right? On expanding existing businesses that are in this space, 
um, on innovating. We, we, and we've done it, right? We've done it as a state. We, we've, been a, we've been that leader, right? We've been a state of first. Um, and, and if you think about it, you know, we, we've got the makings for that here. We've got an incredible talent pool here. We have uh, incredible committed individuals, you know, working every day towards us. And we've got a committed, you know, government that, that wants to partner to get this done. And so when you think about what that means for the space of climate innovation, for climate tech, for new businesses, right? We've got uh, a cement manufacturer here in, in Massachusetts, yeah. Sublime, right? Cement that's created a, a, a green cement, right? A low carbon cement. That's revolutionary. They, that That's something that that businesses around the world. Yes. Want, right. So there you go. We have that here. We developed it here. We can expand that here, but we need to have the infrastructure for them to be able to expand that here. That's exactly what we're trying to do here with this Office of Energy Transformation. You can see it. You know where we need to go. So what do we have to do? What are the steps to get there? And then you can see results in something like that. Well, Melissa Lavinson, thank you so much. I'm so inspired by this. You are a climate and clean energy rock star. So thank you very much. And thank you, Dorothy, for having us today. Yeah, oh, goodness. Um, I, I've been off screen nodding my head the entire time. Um, this was so exciting and informative and compelling. And it was, you know, echoing uh, the chief's comments. You know, uh, Director Levinson, it was so exciting to hear about your process-based approach that's so inclusive, that is based on a, you know, a just transition. Of course, and thanks for your shout outs about Cape Cod. We're delighted um, that you understand that the energy transition is critical and a huge opportunity, but so is resilience. Um, and, you know, we're taping this as Milton is barreling down on uh, the Florida Peninsula right now. And so, you know, Chief Hoffer, to your point about, you know, we've actually had the Cape Cod Commission do an analysis of what happens if we don't do uh, mm -hmm. something on Cape Cod. So we've learned so much. We love your focus on innovation um, and on again, on inclusion, uh, because that is how at all levels, uh, this is uh, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, undertake the challenges that are lie ahead of us. But to both of your points, you know, Massachusetts is leading the nation. Uh, the two of you are evidence that Massachusetts is leading the nation. You are both unique in, in your respective roles. And we're so confident that you are going to continue enabling the Commonwealth to lead in these really important areas. So on behalf of the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative, thank you both so much. And we're really looking forward to see what lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the Collaborative. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.